Hello there. Today I'm going to be reading F.A. Hayek's Road to Serfdom. And we are going to start with, um, let's see here. We're probably going to start with, let's just start with chapter one, The Abandoned Road. We're, we're going to start with The Abandoned Road first off. I'm going to get it out of the way just because I'm going to read like a little bit of it. I don't know if I'm going to read the whole thing because it's going to take like an hour long. I don't want to take a whole hour. I have your time. But we're going to read chapter one. It's called The Abandoned Road. Also, well, it's The Road to Serfdom. I think this is the most important book. I think the Austrian School of Economics is superior to all forms of economics. And so, if people were to listen to this book, this book, while the language isn't very common in today's speech, and I have a very hard time reading it sometimes, um, but one of his... Um, I'm still not reading, I'm sorry. I'm, I want to explain it a little bit on why it's so important. Um, it says, two socialists and socialist parties, I think. Um, who's it addressed to? It's addressed to somebody. Oh yeah, two socialist devout parties. That is who it's addressed to. Okay, let's just read chapter one. Um, um, when in the course of civilization takes an unexpected turn, when instead of continuous progress we have to come to expect, we find ourselves threatened by the evils associated with the past ages of barbarism. Barlo Barbarism, whatever that means, like, uh, like a, what do you call that, barbar, like a barbarian, bar bar barbarianism, we naturally blame ourselves, we naturally blame anything but ourselves, have we not started according to our best lights, many of our finest minds incentively worked to make this better world, a better world, have not our efforts hoped to be directed towards Freedom, justice, and prosperity, if the outcome is so different from our aims, if instead of freedom prosperity instead of freedom and prosperity, bondage and misery stare us in the face. It is not clear that the sinister forces must have been foiled our intentions, that we are victims of some higher of some evil power, which must have been conquered before we can resume the road to better things. However, much we can differ from, we can name the culprit, whether it is wicked, wicked capitalist or a wicked spirit of particular nation, the stupidity of our elders, or the social system, not yet. Although we have struggled against for half a century, fully overthrown, we are, we are all, or at least were, were until recently certainly certain of one thing, that our leading ideals, which during the last generation have become common for most people of goodwill and to determine the major changes of our social life, cannot be wrong. We are except almost every explanation of our present crisis of our civilization except one. The present state of our world may be a result of a gen of a gener genuine error of our part and the pursuit of some charismatic ideals that has appealed produce res results utterly different from those of which we expected. While all of our engines are directed towards bringing the war to a victorious uh, conclusion, he's talking about World War II, by the way, um, I don't want to give too much context. We're just going to keep reading. Um, it is sometimes difficult to remember that even before the war, the values for which we are now fighting were threatened here and destroyed elsewhere. Though for a time being different ideals are represented by hostile nations fighting over their existence, we must not forget 
that this conflict has grown out of the struggle of ideals within what, not so long ago, was a common European civilization, and that the tendencies have culminated in, a, in the creation of totalitarian systems that were not confined to the countries which we have succ succumbed to them. Though the first task is now to win the war, to win it not only to gain another opportunity to face the basic problems to find the over averting the fate of which overtaking kind in civilizations now, somewhat different to think of Germany and Italy or Russia, not as different worlds, but products of their own, of a development of thought in which have been shared it at least it was at least as far as our enemies are concerned easier and more comforting to think that they were entirely different from us and that they were they happened that that cannot happen here yet history of those countries in the years before the rise of totalitarian systems showed a few features with which we are not familiar the external conflict is a result of transformation of european thought in which others have moved so faster to bring them into unrecognizable conflict with our ideals, but which has not left us unaffected. That change of ideals and the force of human human will not be made to the world what is now, though the men have not foreseen the results, and no spontaneous change in the facts obligated us to adapt our thought to perhaps particular difficult for the Anglo-Saxon nations to see. Thus, as this development, um, they they have fortunately for them lagged behind most of your most of the European people. We still think of their ideal that we still think the ideals will which guide us, and that guided us for the past gen generation. The ideals that are only realized in the future, and that are not aware with how far the twentieth. The 25 years had already transformed not only the world, but also our own countries. We still believe, until quite recently, we were governed by a vaguely, by what are vaguely 20, 29 century ideals of principle of those that are impatient to speed up to change. There are, there may be some justification for such a belief. Although, until 1933, England and America had followed slowly on the path in which others had led. Even by then, then they had moved so far that only those with, whose memory goes back two years before wits the war known as what a liberal could be like. And when he means liberal, I don't, I don't really know. It's like an older term for liberal. I don't really understand. There's like a different definition. Okay. Let's read the next page. I finished that page. Page 66. By the way, there's 65 pages of introduction. I didn't want to read all of that. So we're just reading chapter one. Because I think the chapter is very good. Um, the crucial point in which our people are, are still... So under aware is, however, not merely the magnitude of the changes on which had taken place during the last generation, but the fact of the mean uh, that they mean a complete change of the direction of evolution of ideals and social order. For at least the last 25 years before the specter of totalitarianism became a real threat, we had progressively built, moving away from the basic ideal which Western civilization has been built. That this moment on which we have entered such high hopes and ambitions should have brought which should have brought us face to face with the territory and horror has come to profound shock for this generation, which still refuses to contact the two facts. Yet this development merely confirms the warnings of our fathers and liberal philosophy that we still profess. We are progressively abandoning the, that freedom in economic affairs without the personal and political freedom 
that has never existed in the past. Although we had warned of some of the greatest political thinkers of the 19th century by Tillock and Lord Axon that socialism means slavery, we are steadily moving moved in the direction of socialism. Now, and now, that we have seen a new form of slavery arise before our eyes, we are completely forgetting the warning that our sc scarcely occurred to us and how two things may be connected. How, how a sharp break is not only in the recent past, but the whole evolution of Western civilization and the modern trend towards socialism means clear that if, that we are not considered merely against the background of the 19th century, but but in no longer historical precedent. We are rapidly abandoning the views of Cotton and Bright, of Matt Adam Smith and Human, or even of Locke and Mitten, but one of the salient charismics of Western civilization. It has grown the foundations led by Christianity and the Greek, Greeks and Romans. Not merely the 19th and 18th century libertarianism, but the basic individualism inherited by Atifis and Magris and, from Kaios and Kaios and Persides and Tyrus is a progressively relentless. I don't know who all those people are. They're probably philosophers of some kind. The Nazi leader who would describe himself the National Socialist Revolution has been, uh, been counter-revolutionary. Renaissance spoke more truly than he probably knew. It is a decisive step in the destruction that our civilization, which modern men has built up from the from the age of the Renaissance, and which all above an individualistic society. Individualism has a bad name today, and the term has come to be connected with egoterrorism and selfishness. Um, but individualism. Which is, which we speak in contrast with to socialism and all other forms of collectivism has no necessary connection with these. Only gradually, if in the course of this book, we shall be able to make clear the contrast between two opposing principles: the essential features of individualism, which elements provided by Christianity and the philosophy of classical antiquity which were fully developed during the Renaissance and since have grown to spread into what we know as Western civilization and the respect of individual man as quota man, that is, the recognition of his views and tastes as supreme in his own sphere, however naturally may be cumbered some. The belief has been desired that men should be developed as his own gifts and bents, freedom and liberty, are now words so worn with use and abuse that we must hesitate to employ them to express the ideals for which they stood in that period. Tolerance is perhaps the only word that still prevails the full meaning of a, prin of a principle of which the whole period of ascent and only in recent times has again been in decline. To disappear completely the arise of the of the totalitarian state. So basically, he's saying that there's two viewpoints, and he believes that national socialism, which is the Germans, what the Germans were doing, he believes that they were actually socialists. He thinks that they're they're not actually capitalists, and it, this is the manifesto that he says. This is his political essay or his political manifesto that he says. What the Nazis are doing is they, they are saying that they're socialists. They they want to benefit the state. They want the state to to, to give the pe they want to give welfare benefits to people. They want to give them jobs. They're they're willing to they're willing to control the economy to give people jobs. F.A. Hayek doesn't like that. He wants private businesses to give people jobs. He thinks that private businesses compete. So people get jobs, they lose employees, oh that business goes under. He wants it to be rapidly changing and all the time. And he believes that whenever you get the government involved in something, that totalitarian totalitarianism is closer and closer to becoming a reality. And it's a, he believes it could be a rapid or gradual process. And he believes in the United Kingdom is becoming more gradual than in Germany, I think, at least from what I can tell. But he says it, it becomes more rapid if you get like a very charismatic guy like the 
National Socialist Revolutionary um, guy in Germany. We're not going to mention his name, but you know he does. He did. I think he does mention it um, in this book. Um, I'm going to read the last. Um, I don't know what page I'm going to stop at, but um. Yeah, I mean, I'm just trying to explain. This book is fantastic. It tells you that, uh, you know, we should try... And F.A. Hayek actually says, where does welfare benefits stop? In his other book, called The Constitution of Liberty, he believes that welfare is inherently unequal because how do you determine who gets welfare and who doesn't? And he also says, in his other in his other book, he also says, um, The Constitution of Liberty, this is the road to serfdom, in the Constitution of Liberty, he says, um, what is it? That the free market should always be, you should not, you should not abuse the free market over the welfare benefit. Or welfare benefits should not be uh, abused over the free market. People should always think about the free market before they go to welfare. Um, he believes that under, underemployment rate is actually caused by, by underemployment benefits, which I can kind of agree with that. He believes that in order to um, shape the economy with less debt, and he's a, you know, he's big of a, he's more of like, let's boost GDP production. He believes that um, as long as you're not being coerced in transaction, and there are many different businesses that have the same transaction costs, um, very similar transaction costs, and they're constantly competing and improving on each other. Um, he also, you know, he believes that school is a inherently totalitarian system because it's all supported by government money kind of. he believes that you should try your best not to give as you should try to give as little government money as possible but you should still have rules in place you should still have a referee and he in his other book he really did draw a line this book he's just arguing against the state um uh yeah impeccable classic of work of political philosophy intelligible and cultural history of economics the Road to Serfdom, inspired by politicians, scholars, and general readers of half a century. And it's a very interesting idea. He believes that... He even inspired George Orwell in the back, it says here. Um, and George Orwell actually did use some of the ideals in this book. Which I kind of think is very interesting that um, in the in um, George Orwell's book he says freedom is slavery because you know animals are inherently we animals are free to graze but they're also free to be slaughtered and so he kind of justifies it with the same ar argument of the road to serfdom um, that Nazi Germany used people as animals they were they had the freedom to work but. They didn't have the freedom to choose what job they wanted. They had the freedom to get shot. You earned your right to get shot. And so that's kind of what he's arguing in the Road to Serfdom, that we should never build a society off of the freedom to get shot. And um, I, I kind of like that idea. I think he's very humanitarian in some regard because of it. Um, a lot of people would disagree with him. I mean, in some ways, yes, um... You know, I do think that some of the economic policies that Germany had during the war were pretty good, and then they were pretty bad at the same time. Like, you know, he argues that if you destroy him, uh, destroy disabled people, right? And in this book, he also argues that we shouldn't be killing people who who are inherently disabled who can't work, um, because the road to serfdom says it's it it's slowly gradually in the book it's slowly gradually turned into a society which you would not want to live it becomes dull and dark and boring and all you think about is the state and um every day i think that we are getting closer and closer towards the road to serfdom and we are going further and further away from what fa hayek was trying to say and he is a very the problem with fa hayek is he doesn't he doesn't explain things in the simplest of terms. This is really made for the intellectuals of, of Britain. This wasn't made for the intellectuals of the United States. And my goal in this series is to try and understand what he was trying to say in this book. And I'm going to try to see if I can try to understand his argument against 
social planning against uh, government control of the economy. I'm going to see if I can try to do it in this series. That That's my goal. This will be episode one of trying to explain The Road to Serfdom because I really love this this book. I really love the ideal. I've never seen any book that argues against socialism, so to see the other side of it, like maybe Capitalism and Freedom I have seen, where he talks about how Karl Marx values labor over transactions, but this book is just an overall very hard book to read. I, I've had an extremely hard time reading this book. Like, it's so many big words. I still don't understand half the words I was reading when I was reading to you guys, but I'm going to try my best in this series to really focus in on this uh, book. Um, it, it's a fantastic book. I just wish I had I had somebody to, like, simplify it because I've been trying to find videos on it, and I realized maybe if I made my own video and had my own comment section comment on my video, which I do have a few commenters on my YouTube channel. Thank you guys for commenting on my YouTube videos. It's gotten a lot easier explaining everything. Uh, for people who have questions about this book or like put your questions in, in the bottom. I think I can, there's like an index in the back of the book. And if you have a question based on the index in the back of the book, I can go to that word on the comment section and I can read that little section of the book. Because I don't know how to start from beginning to end. This book's a little too big for me to be reading fully on YouTube. I've read the whole book. Um, I really love chapter 15, How to Make a New World Order, uh, The League of Nations. or uh, I think it was the United Nations. I don't remember what he advocated for, but he saw, said how the League of Nations failed after World War One and how they were going to make a United Nations after that. I think they were arguing for that in the back of the book. I don't know. I forgot. Um, I'm, I'm, I have the book in my hand. I just, um, I don't know, but... Yeah, oh, Prospects of an International Order. Yeah. Um, he's a very pro-immigrant kind of guy, too. He doesn't, he likes immigrants, so that's what I kind of like about his stuff. But then he's an immigrant himself. I mean, he moved to the United Kingdom to argue against what, he was arguing against the British people who said they're abandoning their ideals. So it is very interesting to hear his argument. Um... But here's this um, coat of arms. I like the coat of arms. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> I'm looking at the aesthetic of the book. It's uh, it's a beautiful aesthetic. Um, let's see. I'm trying to find one of the most important books of our generation. I don't know. I can't find. Um, Henry has it. Actually, wrote a book. I wrote a thing on it. I might actually try to read Henry Hazard's book. Um, I was thinking about getting it, but I have not gotten Henry Hazard at all yet. He would probably be way easier to read. Uh, he wrote his book in 1944. Um, actually, the same year this book came out. So, 1944 is when this book came out. Henry Hazard made his book, and it was again. It was in, he was American, so he was a little bit separated from the war. Um, but um, this one's British, so. Uh, he's German speaking, but he's British, so it's very interesting. I'm trying to find um, what I'm thinking about. I don't know. I'm just looking at the book. I should not be looking at the book, but I, I should probably read more. But um, anyway, this is someone and someone else. This is I'm someone and you are someone else, and um, uh, uh, you are someone and I'm someone else, and this is a book that I'm gonna read. On my channel. Like little sections here or there. Um, goodbye. You are someone and I am someone else.